Oh, yep. The, oh. Yes, right. you can't see it very well, but there it is, and you can see how Oh, my Charlie, is that a magic disappearing cup that people can buy? Well, only with the blue screen <laughs> uh, effect. Oh, we have the Capes and Lunatics t-shirt, see? Nice. In delightful, stylish colors. I got the black because it's so slimming. Uh, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay, so you saw Under the Helmet and you saw the Faithful Wookiee, right? Yes. Okay. Um I am excited to hear your thoughts on the faithful Wookiee. Um, right. I mean, yeah, there's it's, not it's, much to say. It's like there's it is not it much is. to say, but we will say it. Then that is yeah. the point. Okay, we'll start with faithful Wookiee, and then we'll go to um, under the helmet. That is my plan. If that works for you, sounds like a plan. Okay, and recording has already started. <laughs> Let me just pull up the ones. Oh, yeah, that's that. That's that. Okay. <clears throat> I'm asked to be hearty and welcome once again to full stream ahead. I be your captain, Charlie, the Professor Esser. And with me, as always, is me first mate and skinny rich friend. It's Maz. Welcome, Mazzy. Oh, so glad to have you. In a world of pink goop, covering a planetoid, and sleeping sicknesses that drop humans, but not Wookiees, there's one being who stands above the else. They are, he is, the faithful Wookiee. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to... Uh, full stream ahead we have just finished the latest appearance of boba fett in the book of boba fett and to round out our season we thought we would go back to the very first appearance of boba fett though technically not the first appearance because we'll talk about that in a little bit in uh the next episode but the first in canon story in the uh, Star Wars universe of Boba Fett. That is the story of the faithful Wookiee. Originally part of the Star Wars holiday special, this short follows Chewbacca searching for a cure to a virus that puts his friends to sleep. He encounters an unexpected ally, bounty hunter, Boba Fett. Our director this week is David a comba, a writer, of course, was George Lucas. He got that thing. And then our stars, we got Anthony Daniels as C-3PO, uh, Harrison Ford as uh, Han Solo, uh, Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker, James Earl Jones as Darth Vader, and the great Don Franks as Boba Fett himself. Oh, this is... Uh, this is a move. This was a a, a thing they did, uh, Maz. Um, <laughs> Holiday specials with little cartoon vignettes. Yeah, well, you know, here's what I'll say. Well, like, I mean, know, they, they do it now too. We have what if, right? Those are like well, little yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it works in that in that in that sense. And this is so. Here's here's some history on this. The artist who does this is the guy who did Yellow Submarine for the Beatles. So at the oh. time, this was actually considered a very avant-garde piece. This was really meant to bring the seriousness of the Star Wars franchise to the holiday special, which Lucas denies he had anything to do with. But, you know, let's not also not forget that Lucas gave us Jar Jar Binks, too. So Lucas loves the, ch the childlike aspect of aspects of these things. So it's sort of like when uh, Nicolas Cage now says he is naming himself after the minimalist composer Cage, John Cage, rather than Luke Cage, Power Man. Mm. You know, we all remember the earlier interviews. We all remember what he originally said. You know, it's, yeah. you know, it's like when uh, Alan Moore, you know, you can find the old interviews where he's praising the Watchmen movie before it was made, you know. Well, the original idea, which was a pretty crazy story too. We all I were liked young the, the Watchmen movie. I thought it was really good. Oh, I enjoyed the Watchmen movie too, but there's actually a much worse Watchmen movie that did not get made first. 
Ah. that he did praise and that was that there's a whole bunch of stuff that you there, there's legends of it you know basically when Alan Moore first started like all young artists he was a young artist and it was like yeah oh they're gonna make a movie of my silly ideas and I'm gonna get paid a little extra cash out of the deal that sounds fun you know and uh you know it was a very different film with a with ironically a more heroic uh, comedian character so you know who knows what that would have been had it ever been made but anyway but in this moment george lucas you know they're making the holiday special and it is kind of you know with you or without you you know we're gonna make this thing uh, this is a very hot property we want to do something with it right. and you know honestly i think it gets judged too harshly by the kind of Bush Belt comedy of it and the eroticism of the VR that uh, the old that the old Wookiee uses. Mm. But quite frankly, you know, I don't know if I was in a galaxy far, far away and I was an old Wookiee and they have space dancing, you know, uh, uh, ladies, maybe that would be cool for me. You know, it's like... <laughs> Maybe we don't need to see that for, for <laughs> what what the old Wookiee is doing, but still. But let's get to the actual piece, because this is like the one bit of the holiday special that is allowed to live and breathe and be canonical, um, hmm. which is the faithful Wookiee. Which, uh, and apparently there's like a relic that they have to pick up but the relic has a sleeping sickness on it, which is what we find out. This is the big deal. It's like um, there is a sleeping sickness that's associated with the relic that the, the Empire wants. And, but, of course... But yeah. they also just sell the cure in shops around town? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's an OTC <laughs> drug. And that, that's a good thing. Hey, you know what? I, I'll give it this much. It's like, you know, it's, it's funny because it's kind of like... Uh, Speaking of the modern commercialization of medicine in its own way, it's like, hey, get your sleeping sickness. Honestly, it's kind of this thing where you kind of imagine like, oh, I, you know, if you want to get super deep into like your own head cannon, it's like, well, what the emperor wanted the sleeping sickness for was if they could get this sleeping sickness spread around the galaxy, then everyone is beholden to the cure. Right. And it's interesting that they had to go all the way into the city center to get it. The people out in the dunes and whatnot would not have had access to it. So, yeah, although I guess, you know, you have speeder bikes. I mean, I'm sure you could get it if you needed it. Like if you right. needed the cure, it was available, um, which makes me wonder if this is even kind of this thing where the empire is just sort of t sort of test marketing. Can mm. we make us can we keep populations in control? with a virus you know it with a some sort of a sleeping sick, sickness yeah, like i said there's so many things you can expand out from it um, I, I just thought the visual also was interesting as they were getting to the city center you see all the pollution coming out from the city and draining the natural world around it well yeah because that's what cities do you know you put a bunch of people anywhere they're going to cause problems because at the end of the day, you know, human or any kind of humanoid isn't going to want to just live in the wild. Who wanted to live in the wild would still be monkeys, you know? I mean, that was the thing. We had an option. We said, you know, stay in the trees and eat bananas or come out and build society. And we said, well, let's build society instead. And to be fair, the life quality of a human versus the life quality of a monkey arguably you know humans got the edge because you know we have candy and you xbox know? candy and xboxes yes <laughs> and you know cheap entertainments of all sorts you know right you know you can you know monkeys don't have literature humans have literature and storytellers and things like that you know and yeah we have to destroy the environment but at least we have good stories while we're destroying the environment right. that's the idea it's either going to be us or an asteroid, you know? I mean, might as well, well be yeah. us. yeah. <laughs> might as well, you know? I mean, honestly, there's so many things that will destroy this planet eventually. At least we right. have a say if we destroyed ourselves, you know? Right. And uh, that's the way I feel about most things. Hey, look, man, I'm not terribly worried. Something's going to get me. 
you know? You know it's, we're just putting the whole planet on hospice. That's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? We're just going to relax. It's going to go. But we're going to try and make it as comfortable for us as possible. You know what? Until if, the if, end comes. if it's getting a bit much for you, let me give you a little bit of this sleeping virus. Take a nap. Yeah, <laughs> we'll hang upside fine. down. You'll you, you'll you'll be alive. <laughs> and then we'll give you the thing. Everyone comes out of that just fine, you know. What a strange Honestly, thing, the... though. You catch the virus and you fall asleep, but for some reason they have to hang you upside down. Otherwise, what? Well, you die. I imagine otherwise you die. Yeah, I imagine that. But then it's not it's... really a sleeping virus. It's a virus that you can avoid by. I mean, well, it's, I mean, it's... it's a virus that, or and actually, I don't know. Did they even say it was a virus or? They, it's a sickness. It's a sleeping sickness. Mm -hmm. And that the way you keep people alive when they have this is you hang them upside down. And I guess that basically it prevents you from like choking on your own tongue, mm -hmm. vomiting into your own mouth, you know. He said something about the blood rushing to the brain to keep that alive kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a big part of it too. That made me the heart slows down. So you kind of got to help gravity do the work, you know. Like getting the old blood out, it's relatively easy. And you can get it back up to the lungs, but then you just need it to just flow back down because it's just, it's, you know, you don't want to be fighting against gravity to keep the brain alive. Um, Could you hypothetically take a body and just keep turning it this way and this way to simulate the pumping of the blood, let gravity do its work? I mean, you would need a certain amount of G forces to be able oxygen, to. That's the thing, you have to oxygenate it. So, but yes, theoretically, if you sort of put someone kind of, we don't want to be in a centrifuge. Or you not even, but you could just make them go up and down, like in an elevator, up and down with just the right amount of G-forces to make the blood. So essentially speaking, if you think about it this way, if the blood has its own inertia, the blood would stay here and the body would just move about the blood. Yeah, but the thing is you have to keep it oxygenated. Right, so right. But but I mean, just make just, sure the air is coming into the lungs. I mean, that's let's, the say, let's say, for example, it. hypothetically for this hypothetical, we super yeah. oxygenated the blood for like, let's say for five minutes. And we'd have enough oxygen for the body to be able to operate for five minutes. And then if you were to just do this, would it at least accomplish the circulatory portion of what we need? I to? mean, it theoretically could, but that's I think that, I mean, arguably that's what we have heart lung machines for. So it's like, there's a much simpler solution called a heart lung machine where it's like, right. no, this will just keep you alive. We can just keep you alive. I mean, probably arguably somewhat indefinitely, like, it, it, it's weird it's like i think you could like keep a dead body alive on a heart lung machine yeah. arguably for mm -hmm. years if you keep it you know nutriated um before everything else starts to break down because eventually you know oh the toxins build up and the liver stops right 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 pancreas goes you know don't mess and with that pancreas sedentary man. nature of your existence at that point probably is not good yeah. for your organs or your yeah, well, exactly. That's the thing. It's like it's just everything just starts to break down. But in the short term, mm. we can hang you upside down. It's going to mm. keep you alive, and we can go down to the city center and bring out and buy the brown. No, don't die from sleeping medicine. Mm. <laughs> Have you had Tastes your second good. dose yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you need it. You know, that's the thing. Like I said, I like I can build out a head cannon from this that is really awesome about the bio warfare plans for the empire to control the galaxy mm. you know and just what year know, was this just, this was 1970 i want to say 1975 it was just after it came out no it might, might have been 1970 78 or 78 yeah it was just after star wars dropped and was the thing you know, Star Wars was just, you know, a break the bank kind of kind of moment in cinematic history. And so immediately they said, well, let's do something with these characters. This is really valuable IP. You know, mm. this is I think this is the start of IP, quite frankly. I mean, IP existed. Obviously, there were the serials for the pulps and things got adapted into other genres. But this was like the first time where someone said, oh, my goodness, the T-shirts are selling better than the movie you know yeah, it, it's it's so funny how how much star wars reminds me of kiss oh yeah it's the same it's the same i mean it's the same aesthetic you know well, and, no no i meant as far as the commercialization of it how many mm -hmm. figurines and like you could slap that on anything you know 
uh, slippers, lunch boxes, pencils, you know, shoes, I, anything you can imagine can have that slapped onto it. And that was Gene and Paul's plan from the start. Right. You and know? I think that's the only thing that I've seen as prolific as Star Wars is, is probably Kiss. Yeah, because as, uh, that's, merchandising. That's what they that that was the real revelation. And really, that was the thing that like George Lucas revolutionized. Like, you can say Blockbuster all day, but what George Lucas really said was, oh, I want to hold all the toy rights so that every toy that gets made on this product, I get a nickel on. And so every Boba Fett they make, every <laughs> every every um, Mark Hamill, everything that they make, George Lucas got those nickels on. Because he knew that's the sweetest plum. Because he knew that you know, what kids really want, they want to go see a movie, yes, but what they really want is to go home and play with the toys and write their own stories. So they were just like big two-hour-long commercials. They, it was a great toy commercial. It was the first mm. blockbuster toy commercial, and George Lucas saw it all. That's where that's, that's really where you can say the man was a genius. No, it's so funny just thinking about like realigning energies and intentions of different people, right? He found something that people were willing to pay for and then said, I'm going to use this money to actually create like great art. What a great and margin of and commercialism and art. Arguably, although obviously there are a lot of people that, you know, as I always say, everyone hated Star Wars from the first one. You know, it's, yeah, but are you are, 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 are you doing good art if some people aren't angry and hating it? You know, well, exactly. You know, that's yeah. the thing. It's it's it is delightful. It is a great hero's epic journey and it is mythos. Mm. And, you know, and the same is true of of modern IP of the Marvel Universe and the DC Universe and any any pulp universe that you want to throw out there. You know, this is all just the stories that we tell each, tell ourselves around the campfire, mm -hmm. you know, when we're building out our universes, because that's what we want. We want to have those stories that carry us forward. And this is really the first expansion of the Star Wars universe, because this is the first time we're on a completely different world. Yes, we have our main characters, but even that gets sort of secondary because the one main character we have, Chewbacca, doesn't really speak. Right. You know? And then, so it's really, this is really Boba Fett's time to shine. You know? And I love, and it's something I realized that Tamir Morrison is trying to do uh, Dan's voice in this. And I never realized that that's not just, uh, that I always just assumed, oh, Tamir Morrison that the Boba Fett voice we know is Demir, Tamir Morrison's voice, but no, oh, it's it actually, has been. yeah, but it's actually Dan right. Frank's voice. He's doing that voice, <laughs> which quite frankly moves uh, Boba Fett up uh, or Tamir Morrison up in my recognition of him as an actor that, oh no, he said, okay, what's the history? How does this guy talk? Right. And so let me try and match that. Let me try and make this guy as close to that as I can, as I put it my own special spin on it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he did, and he did. And that's that's neat, you know? Um, it was really interesting because you always sort of like, as someone who didn't grow up with it, right? You always think of Star Wars and you think of everything. You think the of the entirety of, of the whole enterprise across decades, you know. But then to hear them talk after the first movie, man, we had to follow up with something good. It's so interesting to hear them not know that it was going to be as giant of a phenomenon. Well, we had one good movie. We got to make sure we get the next one. It's so, it's so interesting to hear that perspective. Yeah, and, and this really, as a follow-up, I think The Faithful Wookiee is probably as good as you could hope for from a TV production mm. for it, you know, and this idea of the, of the, um, uh, characters in this small, short, short, short subject setting. Um, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed, um, what we are. I actually, you know, one of the things I found really interesting in this is that, uh, Luke is flying a Y wing and, mm. That is interesting to me in the sense that, yes, there are X-Wings and there are Y-Wings, and these are both ships that exist in the um, 
larger Star Wars universe. But prior to this, we always saw Luke fly an X-Wing and it's sort of his ship is an X-Wing. But that he's in this old Y-Wing, it's kind of like, oh, wow. You know, this was before that was an established thing. He's going to fly this Y-Wing and it's got a droid port too. And it's interesting in its own right when we look at later stuff because you realize, oh, wow, you know, the Y-Wing actually is very similar to the old Republic uh, fighters Hmm. that now um, the Mandalorian is driving. You know, it's just that they move that the old Republic have the two the two pylons in the front, whereas the Y Wings had them in the back, not not dissimilar from the Star Trek design. Hmm. So it's like, oh wow, you know, there actually are these like weird little similarities, the way that the sci fi is influencing itself to other things. Um uh I'm a little I'm a little disappointed that um Chris Mayhew isn't credited in this for Chewbacca's voice. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he did or did not do it. Um, but it is a little weird, you know. Um, you know, uh, Anthony Daniels does get the C-3PO. Because Anthony Daniels, C-3PO, he does the most talking in this. Uh, <laughs> Wait, you know, but is, but, this, is this someone making sounds with their mouth? C-3PO sounds? Or are they just digital sounds created? Uh, well, actually, both uh, Kenny ba- Kenny Baker did the C three PO whistles. That was him, um, and they maybe they maybe made them a little more metallic when they ran ran them through later. But um, wow. but Chris Mayhew, Chewbacca, that oh, that's yeah, all yeah. Chris Mayhew. Well, um, yeah. Uh, but Chris Mayhew doesn't get the credit for this, and that's so that's no. But I'm just I mean like you probably don't necessarily need anybody can do that, you know. So they necessarily. They didn't want to not have him come down yeah. for 10 minutes worth of dialogue. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, but I'm sure he would have loved to have gotten paid, you know. Sure. That's sure. always the thing. But they also had to get Harrison Ford down there, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know. And Harrison Ford has hated Star Wars ever since this. I mean, the more and more like he, the he can talk thing. as he gets older, I don't think he likes very much. He hates everything. He's just like a old curmudgeon nowadays. Yeah, well, you know, because he got, he became a movie star and he doesn't like it, you know? He's one of these guys who, you know, clearly sold his soul to the devil for fame. Yeah. And then he got famous and he doesn't like it, you know? It's like, well, yeah. of course not. You sold your soul to the devil for fame. What did you think was going to happen? You know, what did you think was going to be the outcome of you, you know, wanting to be famous? And it's like, well, there you are. You're famous. And, you know, you want to do, you just want to make art. Well, then, you know, then make art. No one's stopping you. Yeah. You can paint, you can do indie films, you can do whatever the heck you want. But if you want to fly experimental aircraft, that takes money. So go do a blockbuster, you know? Yeah. And maybe be happy that you're doing it. <laughs> right, you know? right. And he's going to do another Indiana Jones. I guess he likes Indiana Jones better than Han Solo. I guess yeah, that's what he gets. And, he gets and, to be the star. After of Indiana. like, uh, what was? I think there's been two really bad Indiana Jones movies recently, right? One was Shia LaBeouf, and then another one after that too. Well, no, the, the one after that hasn't been done yet. So, oh, okay, yeah, that's we Shia don't know LaBeouf how bad was. it's going to be yet. Yeah, I mean, I had high hopes too because Shia LaBeouf is is a pretty good actor, and he seemed oh, like yeah. a, he would have been a good natural. I just, just the movie and the storyline was just really terrible. I, I think the aliens kind of kind of kind of hurt it. You know, yeah. I think once you get into that weird aliens, yeah. There, you know, well, it's we're like not, you can, we're not you can talking do about gods history and anymore. beings, but like don't, right. don't don't go to space. Don't yeah. go full alien. That, that that's the moral of the story. Yeah, um, it's too close to Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need uh, something more grounded. Uh, yeah, um, you know, I would love for 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 Indiana Jones to just find like you know oh it's excalibur no it's just a really well-made sword yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no this was like I mean, for the age this would have been like you know the freaking you know ibm x missile of swords but no it's just a really good like someone found titanium and made a sword of titanium in the middle ages which you could do you just had to get it hot enough and hit it enough and you could make a 
really strong sword. Right. And that's what it was. That's all Excalibur ever was, was just a really strong sword. But it was just really one good. One person knew how to make it. The legends just uh, wrote themselves and exaggerated along the way. Exactly, you know. Uh, but that's not what Indiana Jones necessarily is. Because it's a mystical universe with gods and Hindu gods and Christian gods and every god you want. Right. You know? Right. Oh, but anyway, but that's, but, you know, uh, I like the little bit at the end where, you know, uh, the wiki never trusted Boba Fett because he didn't right. smell right. He I love that funny. he's just simply a bad guy. Like it was back in the day where you didn't need to soften up the bad guy to make people like the bad guy. He could just be a bad guy and when people would just like still gravitate towards the bad guy. They didn't need oh, to yeah. make him redeemable in any sense. He was just what he was. I thought that was kind of Well, cool. you know, and here's what it comes down to. And it goes back to the classic, you know, it goes back to the classic Westerns that um, Robert Rodriguez and uh, Jean Favreau have pulled upon in these things, which is the idea that, you know what? Yeah, they're bad guys, but they're also men of men who take their own sense of self seriously. Of duty, and they're not. Of yeah, duty. they're yeah, they're not. You know, it's like they don't care who they're killing, but they're. If you ask them to kill someone, they're going to kill them properly. You know, right. <laughs> they take yeah. their job very seriously, and uh, there's playing... there's a there's a workman like glory in that. You know? Right. I was I was playing a game, a cyberpunk, and there's a character in there who talks about um, uh, his honor and he works for like an evil corporation. And he goes, oh, you don't have any honor, yada, yada, yada. And he goes, listen, you don't understand what I'm talking about. Please do not confuse honor with your petty morality. And I was like, that's such yeah. an interesting point to make. Like honor is, is different than morality. People always see them parallel, but they don't necessarily have to be viewed that way. I was like, wow, that's a fascinating concept. No. And, and, you know, and morality is always in its own way, it's its own self-serving uh, thing. You know, we, morality is, I don't want to be hurt and I want no one else to be hurt. Hmm. Um, honor is, I have your an word, obligation. Your word, whatever the contextual yeah. framework is, that's just your word. Your yeah, responsibility, exactly. I, your obligation, do you live up to that? I respond to my obligation. And now you can have a morality and honor be conjoined where it is dishonorable for me to hurt others because I do right. not wish to be hurt or just, I do not wish to hurt others because why should, because I have the ability to hurt others. Why should that be a motivation? You know, um, <laughs> you know, that's the old, uh, the old. Um, it's also about uh, like giving up to like the thing to say that things are bigger than you. Right. My choices alone aren't going to fix the, or whatever these giant problems. I am where I am and I have uh, uh, somebody I work for, somebody I'm responsible to or whatever. And those other problems are bigger than me. I'm just a cog in the wheel. Wherever I end up, I have to play my part. But wherever I do, I have to play my part honestly. Um, so well, exactly. you know, it's like in that way, you're able to let go uh, of the morality and just concentrate on your immediate surroundings and what you're supposed to be doing exactly and that is exactly what he does you know he he says i am i am boba fett and i am obliged to do the work i was asked to do and if people want me to exist in one way or another that's not my problem right. i have to pay me and i'll do whatever this is the way this is the way you know <laughs> and to be fair that is even the mandalorian way Right. which exactly. is that you know you don't go back on a job but when 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 uh uh Jin Darren does go back on the job the other men will say no we're going to defend you even though it's going to kill us and destroy us we'll still protect you because even though that part of the code you violated um we, you're still part of us yeah and no one crosses us and we're going to assume that your moral direction to make this choice was for the good you know and that's what it comes down to you know mm. we we need to find the good of our goals and um yeah i mean i enjoyed the faithful wookie it's it's yeah it's a little light and it's a little silly because it's 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 for what it is um and it's it wasn't a, complicated there wasn't a terrible amount of nuance it was pretty straightforward but it was interesting 
Yeah, and it is just, I, I mean, I love the fact that you have that classic thing that everyone's just broadcasting on the same frequency and there's no such thing as encryption. Um, and I love that he, he was writing something much bigger than a rancor. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was, man. That's, he just, he's riding it, man, because he, he, he yeah. you know, he's, he's in his element. That's you great. know, I mean, that's the thing. It's like the Boba Fett backstory is, is glorious. Hmm. And it's like, I really wish, I mean, they probably should do a whole animated book of Boba Fett that goes all the way back. I mean, and probably someone's going to stitch that together. Indeed. Where you go back to the, his first introduction in Clone Wars and put in his, his his animated version and then move to where he becomes an adult and Tamir Morrison and, you know, do that transition. And it's going to be great, you know, because I think that that's the thing that, that we really miss with Boba Fett. That was like the problem with Book of Boba Fett is you had all this backstory that you're trying to put into a spot before it, a spot after it happened, because we end um, Mandalorian with him taking over Tatooine but now we need to know why this is all important. And so it would have been better, arguably, had they started Book of Boba Fett from when he comes out of the rank, uh, out of the um, Sarlacc. Sarlacc pit, you know, and mm. then it becomes a much more engaging story. But because we were already waiting for that other story, you couldn't, you know, it was harder to do. Basically, you know, I mean, that's yeah. the problem. That that was the choice they made, and that was that was that was the thing. All right, Mozzie. Um, any other thoughts on on tonight's episode of the Faithful Wookiee, first appearance yeah. of Boba Fett in the Star Wars canonical universe? I really, I really dug the anime, uh, the animation style. Everything was like super stylized and cool. Love how Harrison Ford's face was like elongated, just like giving you the the emotional timbre of the performance a bit more too uh that was really really cool okay cool i liked it too you know um i i actually now kind of want to go back and rewatch uh the droids cartoon and the mm. ewoks cartoon and part of me like it's like i kind of want to watch those ewoks movies now it's like you know there's actually a lot of interesting stuff that exists in this universe that was already part of it but, you know, we sort of, like, dismissed because, oh, it's Ewoks, who cares? Or, oh, it's just yeah. the droids running around. And it's, like, part of me wonders, like, you know, are there, like, little secret crystal gems in there that we yeah. can find? So uh, that's that's elsewhere on my list of things to do. Mm. All right, Mazi. Um, so, Maz, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm wearing a, 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 a fine new T-shirt today. That, that says that? capes and lunatics mm. yes with our with our superheroic logo here in the middle he's yellow circle man um mm. and that is that is the capes and lunatics logo and i'm also drinking from my fancy there it is capes oh it only exists for a moment in in space time before it not nopes out into the back room um my capes and lunatics uh uh insulated cooling mug made of real aluminium um <laughs> next best thing to best car uh if people would like this they can actually go down into our show notes go to linktree l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash capes and lunatics and find a link to all of our all of our web pages and and merch pages uh they can um purchase these items for their own use likewise they can find the patreon page where they can start to give money to the capes and lunatics network uh help fund our quick static adventures into finding the worst superhero film of all time and get a vote in that uh likewise if they want to talk to us like with their voices like human beings they can call us at 614-382-2737 that's 614-38capes they can call us leave us a message and we will play that on the ear for any of our shows that you want to reference because we want to hear from you guys hear your voices hear your thoughts and uh comment on them and talk back to you in this sort of delayed telephone game likewise you can email us 
at capesandlunatics at gmail.com. That's capes and, capes and lunatics, all spelled out at gmail.com, where you can give us your written thoughts if you want to compose yourself a little more deeply. Um, and if they want to reach you personally directly, Moz, how can they do that? Oh, they can email me at mozmanzor at gmail.com or find me on Facebook under Moz Manzor. That's M-O-Z-Z-M-A-N-Z-O-O-R. And, of course, you can always write to me in that old-fashioned email way, the way our moms and pa's once did, at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word at gmail.com. They couldn't follow me on the Twitter when I actually get the energy to tweet things again. I mean, um... Uh, Naomi is back Tuesday nights at 9 and um, Legends of Tomorrow are back uh, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday nights at 8 and these are both shows I love and I would love to tweet I just gotta get the energy to do so but you can follow me at Charlie Esser that's C-H-A-R-L-I-E E-S-S-E-R look for the two E's in the middle for what? for quality thank you Maz all right ladies and gentlemen thank you once again for joining us here as we sail the briny seas of the internet to find the best streaming content for you please come again next week as we once again sail for stream ahead Arc. all right all right you want to make it just one long thing? yeah yeah I'm just okay gonna... and, yeah what what is that? What is that? Just oh, it's just a doggy bag for for dog poop. I just lying around oh. because, but I'm just putting it in here so Phil can know this is where, visually, if you sort it down. Okay, so he can see like the, a like the a, link. a mark. Yeah, yeah. It's the only 